Um, <clears throat> yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Stuart, I'm a research fellow at the Manchester Centre for Health Economics. Uh, I'm going to talk today about our experience of trying to improve the speed of a discrete event simulation model uh, built in R. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as I've included in my title, uh, I am very much someone who's learning R on the go at the moment as well. So I uh, started to making Markov models and then had to dive into this code that uh, was previously made by Ewan Gray at our centre. <coughs> um, uh, to take it over uh, and improve it. So, so to add some caveats to that, um, so to say this is an ongoing process. It's not in any way meant to sort of slate the original code because it's very complicated, a lot of work went into it. Um, very happy to hear any additional suggestions. Um, and there's some horrific markdown in here. I'm learning that at the moment. I've copied and pasted this, you know. <coughs> so, yeah. <coughs> so as I say, uh, this, <coughs> this model was originally being developed by my colleagues uh, Ewan Gray, Anna Donton and Catherine Payne at the centre and published as an early model. Uh, the purpose of the model is to simulate uh, women going through different breast cancer screening strategies um, and in particular the focus on s is on something called risk stratified breast cancer screening where you predict a woman's risk of breast cancer at her first mammogram and then you change uh, her screening intervals depending on her risk. So higher risk women you maybe invite them every year, lower risk women come free yearly or even potentially you reduce their attendance um, because they're at lower risk of cancer. And so we've been through this process of taking this early model and updating it, um, updating the parameters, going through a validation process um, with the model and part of that we've kind of, yeah, sort of tried to speed the code up a bit as well. <coughs> um, so the original general structure of the model, um, so you start with a really big sample of, of women um, it actually took 10 million women in the original um, code um, to get stable estimates out of this, this model. And because it's so big, you have to split that into different groups. Um, originally, this is in case the model kind of broke halfway through, and so you could sort of save some of those um, simulations, and so you don't have to do it all again. Uh, but it also, also comes in useful in terms of speed later on, which I'll um, explain. Um, this model did have parallel, uh, it was run over parallel um, cores as well, um, using a for each loop. Um, so again, there was some kind of speed stuff in there originally. And essentially, you kind of loop through uh, individual women. So you draw an individual woman and draw a number of um, different parameters, like her risk of, risk of breast cancer, whether she's going to develop cancer, um, mortality age. And you simulate um, that woman through uh, a screening program, uh, through a sort of discrete event simulation. So there's sort of screening, clinical diagnosis, or death events. Um, you record the outcomes. Lots of clinical stuff in there as well as qualities and costs. Um, and then sort of loop around through all the women and then combine them all in a kind of data sample at the end and then separately go and analyse that. So originally this was taking me on my computer, this was an average computer, laptop, uh, about one and a half hours per strategy. So, you know, if you had to, like, this is just a deterministic analysis, so you're taking a whole day really to just to get some results out of it. <coughs> so there are kind of three key approaches you can kind of take at a basic level to speeding up a model. One is kind of making your code more efficient to kind of increase the speed per run of the loop. Um, two is to reduce unnecessary variance in the model, variance reduction. So you have to put less women through this, the model. Or three is just to get a better computer, which I also have done after this, but so all the comparisons were made on my, my average one. Uh, if you are uh, going to be using R a lot, you know, try and get the best computer your university or institution will uh, supply to you because it just makes your life a lot easier. Um, so. Yeah, there's some sort of easy gains you can get by sort of improving model code. Um, so obviously, everything we do in a loop is done by n times. Um, so you know, if we're doing stuff 10 million times, even if we've got things that can sort of save a fraction of a second, when that's multiplied up over that massive amount of runs, um, you know, that can add up to quite a big saving overall. Um, <coughs> and in particular, there are some things we should try and avoid doing in loops if we can. Um, so these are sort of defining new parameters that don't vary. Um, if statements, um, can sort of conditional checks, um, particularly if these are really complicated. Um, and also, you know, the famous one is you shouldn't make things increase in size, like sort of output tables if you can. You should pre-create a kind of open uh, output table that you fill in rather than you know, row binding additional lines to that um, data frame. Because have you heard, you know, it creates a copy of the whole data frame each time you're expanding it, it just uses up loads of memory. So we had a few of these kind of little things we could do in our code. Um, so we have a function that's called every time there's a screening event um, that uh, sort of adjusts the conditional sensitivity of screening um, by a woman's breast density. 
um, breast density um, can basically uh, mask cancers on the mammogram, and so it affects the sensitivity of screening. We had this parameter, like a, a vector, the sensitivity of um, the odds ratio of sensitivity there. Um, it's basically being called every time we ran this function. And women were sort of coming four to five times to screening based on uptake, and so we're basically doing this 40 million times, so we don't have to do this, we took it out. We also had a lot of checks to make sure that people weren't living longer than the end of the model, you know, the quality vectors that we were filling in weren't sort of going longer than the model. And a lot of them were doing the same sort of thing, so we sort of condensed those down as well. Um, so probably a, a few kind of little bits there, you know, e easy, easy wins, but um, the main thing, the big one really, um, uh, you know, that I really recommend is basically trying to take it and say, take as much out of, out of that loop as possible. So what we did um, was pre-creating that sample of women and all their drawn observations, rather than doing it for each individual woman in the loop each time. Um, and it's basically, you, then you just have to iterate over each row in that data frame. Um, you've got the ith observation, rather than doing that all in the loop. And this is uh, it's great because it's um, two birds with one stone, is you've got variance reduction, um, because you can then use that data frame and run the same women for each different strategy, rather than drawing different women in each strategy every time you run it. Uh, and also, uh, it is much quicker um, to do those draws in one big block outside the sample than rather than doing them n times individually. Uh, so, say, again, this is a thing that might benefit people if you're doing a PSA on a kind of cohort model. Um, you know, it's much quicker to do 10 million draws from a distribution and put them in a table rather than drawing individual draws 10 million times in a loop. So I sort of did a very quick simulation of this um, uh, quickly in R the other day. Um, <coughs> uh, so if you <coughs> see the, the first example is where you're drawing individual draws from a beta distribution a million times, <coughs> um, and then putting them into a, an output vector takes 1.65 seconds. And if you do it, um, just pre-draw them all in one go, and then I sort of made it so they get copied across into an output vector to make it a fair test. It's actually about four times quicker to do that here. We have about 16 um, parameters that we're drawing for each woman as well, so you can see that you know the savings are quite um, considerable. And the other bonus of doing this is by you know you can set the seed for those draws as well, so you end up you know if someone wants to recreate your results, um, <coughs> then they can you know get the exact random draws out that you've um, started with. <coughs> so we end up something <coughs> something looks like this that I'm sure no one can read, um, but basically we have individual draws for breast density, 10 year risk, lifetime risk of cancer, um, <coughs> you know, whether people get cancer, and it also allows us to take lots of these kind of if statements out of the loop, so when we put people into different groups based on their, their risk, we can just do that here rather than having to do it every time. Um, uh, when we work out if people are actually going to attend screening as well, um, that what their uptake is, we can take that out of, out of the loop. <coughs> there is a drawback to doing this though, in that you're creating this massive table. Um, so in the first instance we had 10 million women, 16 um, you know, columns that we were drawing. Um, but obviously that's big and uses up a lot of RAM. And so you might not be able to actually fit that, you know, hold that in R. Um, or when you try and actually manipulate that, um, it might not work. Um, and also there's the issue that we have to try and then iterate over those rows, and there was a bit of an issue that I came across when we were doing that that took me ages to fix with a really, really simple solution. <coughs> so solution number one, the big data system, um, big, big data frame, we can solve that by something called chunking. Um, now, if anyone born after 2000, I'm not just being horrible and calling this kid you know, Chunk, that's his name, his character from a, a film called The Goonies. Um, but yeah, basically chunking, involves splitting that big data frame into smaller chunks and then running the model for each individual chunk um, rather than the whole thing at the same time. So you only actually have to load a small part of the data frame into R at a time. Um, so split it up, save the, the rest of the chunks to drive, remove them from the memory, load in one chunk for one loop. And that, so this is where we can use that outer loop that was split in into temps anyway, so it's really useful. Run that through the model, save the results, then load up the next chunk and keep going. There is another problem that that raises is that there's kind of um, a bit of a trade-off. So the more chunks that you have, the less data you're holding in memory. 
<coughs> but that kind of act of loading up each chunk is um, actually something you, you involves too slow processing art. So loading data and then initialising the, the kind of parallel processing as well, that some has a bit of a fixed time cost. So there's kind of an optimal number that you kind of have to, to identify. Um, so we sort of still use about 10 at the moment. <coughs> now the second problem we had uh, was in trying to then actually send different bits of that data frame to the different parallel cores. Um, so uh, if you use just a, a normal iterator we would like we would in a loop, so for i in 1 to n or whatever, um, the problem with that is basically creates a vector of numbers and that vector of number gets sent to each of the cores. Um, when each of the cores starts running, they all start from number one. <coughs> so they all start from row one and go through to a tenth or whatever way through. And so you end up with the same results in every core, which is not great. So really what you need to do is actually ch take your chunk and then split that up further and send individual bits to the different cores. <coughs> um, and actually the way you do that is using um, the iterators package. Um, this is a nightmare, it took me six months to work this out. I'll put it on Twitter, I'll ask Googled everywhere. But yeah, you can use this um, iterator package. Um, and basically it allows you to iterate across a data frame by each row. So it basically sends the rows to the different um, cores rather than just a list of numbers. Um, <coughs> So, so far, um, so I'm on what's called Make for a Screen. Um, we're down now from 10 million women per strategy to 3 million women. Still really big. The problem is basically when you're doing these risk stratified screenings, the differences in the expected qualities and costs are really tiny between some of the strategies because um, they, they don't really vary much. So you have to still have these really big samples. Um, and we've got it down to about a sixth of the run time for some of the strategies so far. <coughs> Now there's additional things that we, we're going to do that we can think we can cut this down even more. Uh, one of the big ones is it's a bit silly, is that only about 12 to 13 percent of the women in our sample actually get cancer, and so you're running 87 percent of that women through that simulation and checking if they've got cancer when they don't really need to be doing that. Now obviously there are still some things those women um, they have false positive results. You know they do have costs and outcomes, um, but what we're planning to do is at least make a kind of quick version of the model where we just take them out of the original data frame and run them through a cohort Markov model and just assign them the same costs or um, qualities um, based on their kind of screening strategy. So the, the um, so time frame of the model is going to vary depending on the, the program. It, it's a little bit overly complicated because your um, probability of attending screening depends on whether you've been to screening or not before. So you have to you know, have these kind of holding states of whether people have been or not. Um, <coughs> another thing we're starting to find, controversially maybe, is we're starting in the screening models um, to kind of push the limits of what we think we can do in R. Um, so we're starting to look at building a model on cervical cancer screening. This is quite complicated because you've also got to build in a model of HPV transmission, uh, which involves sort of sexual contacts. Um, there's also now a dynamic effect of vaccination for HPV over time. We have um, cancer growth models underpinning these as well. Um, and so it becomes very complex as well with the screening and triage strategies. Now, uh, there are some established groups in other countries, in Australia um, and um, the Netherlands and in the US, who do make these kind of very complex models in C, as we um, sort of discussed earlier, or other kind of more efficient languages for doing these really hard, hard work kind of simulations. Um, we, we think, say, so it's quite hard, but it's a trade off. We're, we're really, as a community of health commerce, really just getting to grips with R. So jumping to something you know more complex like C, um, you know, it's that trade-off of speed versus you know actual usability of the model. So we're kind of considering where we might look at Python for actually doing the simulations and generating the data because people might be able to at least look at that and work out what's going on, and then using R to actually do the analysis on on the kind of output data of that. Um, but that's sort of very much under discussion at the moment about how we're going to do that. Um, so that's uh, the end. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, any questions for Stuart? I can see a hand there. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, when you were doing your analysis to work out which bits could speed up, did you use a profiler or did you do it by sort of intuition? Did you 
Yeah. Can <coughs> I just, sorry, you just repeat your question. So uh, there's a question uh, at the back that, uh, asking about what sort of uh, package is it uh, uh, that, that uh, yeah, is used? So, so, so the so technique, the technique to speed up the, the model uh, if it was a profiler or something else. <coughs> yeah, so uh, intuition is the answer. But uh, yeah, I definitely came across the kind of more profile approach. It's one of those things that, you know, you learn the next time I will be looking at that. Uh, I was sort of wondering how well that would do because most of the loops are buried in the kind of parallel process, whether it can get into that process and, and work out what is taking the, the fast, uh, you know, what's going slow or fast within that. Um, but we could sort of just run that separately outside of the parallel code. But yeah, that is something that uh, sort of thought about for the next time. I would. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Again, oh, so sorry. just one comment and one question. So a comment from Philippe from Excel to R, can you do this convention as a way to spreadsheets to programming? But once you move to one programming language, going to another like C or Python, is not actually that difficult. Um, so I think the learning curve through there is not going to be as difficult. And R and HTA can encompass kind of C and Python if you just keep programming for HTA. Um, so I think we, we shouldn't be too scared about that next transition. Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. I've, I've sort of tried to test myself reading some Python code, and I think, like you say, it's more the kind of the jump to programming, and you can kind of work out what's going on. So um, yeah, I think that is, is something that we might look at. We've just hired an explicit mathematical modeler in our center as well, which we've not had before, someone from a, a maths background who has more knowledge of programming than us as well. Who was next, Devin? Again, yeah. we'll probably have more questions. Um, ours is pretty good at iterating across columns, but not rows. Mm. So if you can try transposing. No, we so didn't. So the, the question was about uh, <laughs> if, 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 if Stuart uh, tried transposing the matrix. If no, we haven't actually, but yeah, I'll try and... Uh, it's quite a lot faster. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll try um, take the second question was about anyone who's worked with uh, the elasticity theory or something. Have you tried using lists? <laughs> no, again, it's another thing that I've come across. So, so I'm sort of saving uh, the outputs of, from a loop. I know sort of saving different items of a list and then kind of condensing and stuff. There's lots of tricks that I know you yeah. can use to... I mean, I've, I've optimised a, a math simulation before and got about 100 Okay, yeah. Uh, that sounds great, yeah. Okay. That, all these ideas. I know it's the for each that yeah. <laughs> they can jump on the kind of the, the newish uh, parallelized languages and yeah. use the futures, which is quite great. So yeah, I think I think there's probably definitely better ways to do that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's um, so a couple of questions. Well, that one first, yeah. Uh, can I check what computer you're learning this code on? Because I was doing it in university and my parents knew not to have secret computing devices. So the question is about what, what sort of computer has been used um, and if what computer Stuart has used. Yeah, I mean, the, the originally I was, you know, it was just an eight gig standard university laptop, you know, mid-range one. Um, yeah, we have the, the Scoot supercomputer at Manchester that we have thought about putting us on, but again, it's, I guess it's that kind of trade-off against making no, it accessible to, <laughs> uh, accessible to people to use and read who don't have those resources versus, so there might be a, that you could have a version that you put on there to get quick results out and then, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a conversation we've had. Like that. I am a good old age, it seems like it's not easy for one second, you want to talk about more. Can yeah. everyone, <laughs> everyone mute themselves yeah. while we are discussing Stuart's presentation? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, there was another question over there. Thank you. So the question is about using Python um, in, in, in the middle of, of our code. Yeah, so this is the bit where it, this is sort of the more mathematical modeler that we've hired is dealing with it. Um, I think the idea is to run them in, separately. So you um, would generate uh, <coughs> almost like this table, um, or like an output table with the, the observations per person 
in Python and then import that into R separately rather than trying to run them in the same code. Um, so at the moment, so we're trying to develop this, we have um, an HPV transmission model that's built in MATLAB. Um, and we were like, well, should we try and build that in R? But I don't think it's going to work. So, But it does produce the exact kind of inputs that we need for the R model. So it's, it's a bit of a pain matching stuff up. But it's, it's there's always that question about, you know, should I invest lots of time trying to get more speed out of this each time I do it? Or should I, you know, just deal with it? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's lots of uh, these kind of trade-offs. Any more questions for Stuart? No? Okay, let's thank again Stuart for his presentation.